Welcome to City Service Committee. I'm City Councilor Miriam Labarge, Chair, and I'm joined by Ward 2 City Councilor Karen Foster, Vice Chair, Ward 1 City Councilor Michael Quinlan, and Ward 7 City Councilor Rachel Muir. This meeting is called to order. Roll call, Laura. Sure. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Foster. Here. And Councilor Quinlan. Here. This meeting is being held by a Zoom audio video recording. Our next agenda is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to address the committee on any subject? Jennifer. Unmute myself. Hi, and I believe that's Mary Jo Stanley who's with us. We can't see your face, Mary Jo, but I hope that's you, who's a co cochlear implant liver <laughs> and Northampton resident. Um, thank you for uh, this work that you're doing on accommodations for people with hearing disabilities. Um, I live in Leeds. Um, I lost my hearing in my 30s. So I lived in both worlds of, you know, we're fully hearing and the, I'm now deaf and have been through the, you know, struggling without hearing aids and then a whole series of hearing aids and then ultimately had cochlear implant surgery um, five years ago, which made a huge difference. Um, uh, I wanted, I don't know what's being proposed yet. So I wanted to at least uh, share a couple of notes that I made when, um, when Council Member Maiori and Council Member Labarge and um, uh, Wayne Felden agreed to meet with me to talk about this, which I so appreciated before the pandemic hit. Um, one is that about the importance of multiple accommodation strategies, um, because there are lots of different kinds of hearing loss and lots of different levels of severity. Um, so one piece of equipment or one strategy will not work for everyone. Um, that's really fundamental reality. Um, hearing aid users and cochlear implant users and people who have, have sort of, you know, mild hearing loss that's just volume, uh, you know, just a volume issue have very different needs. Um, so that's thing one. Um, I can't speak to the needs of deaf people who do not use hearing accommodations. Um, so that's a whole other area of accommodation. Um, I, a special, second thing was I wanted to note that I, I hope that you're considering outfitting the council meeting room um, and if it's if possible, additional spaces that are used for public meetings often with an induction loop, a hearing loop, in addition to the, you know, whatever, um, you know, individual devices that would be used for some people. Uh, because those of us who are implanted in people with hearing aids can connect to a loop directly with the T-coil program in the device. So we don't have a, have to come up, you know, wear something. We don't have the issues of, you know, something running out of battery or not fitting over the implant device or the kind of hearing aids we use. There can be real functional problems like that with individual devices. Um, the third thing I wanted to note is the importance of the physical lit physical importance of the physical layout of the space of the meeting room. Um, and I shared with council members Labarge and Maiori that I noticed in last year going to a hearing in East Hampton that their hearing room is set up wide and shallow instead of narrow and deep so that the council members sit in, an, in a sort of semicircle, a very wide semicircle and the audience um, me group members are seated in a wide you know, area of, of uh, you know, where chairs are set up closer to member, council members and people in the audience can see all of their faces. The, the way this city council has been set up in Northampton is with that, you know, space that, that sort of you, you know, you shape. And if you're well aware where you're sitting, you can't see a lot of people's faces and everybody with hearing loss relies on pe seeing people's faces no matter how well the weather is in your head or on your head works, we absolutely rely on that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is about the importance of having people with hearing disabilities 
participating in this process of selecting and vetting whatever you're gonna use. Um, and having people with different kinds of hearing loss using different kinds of devices. Um, just looking back to what I said in the very beginning that given that there's no one size that will fit all. Um, so that's mainly what I wanted to share. And again, thanks so much for you know, managing to get this money in um, and taking this process seriously. And you know, um, you know, as you think about what would work best given the, this resource that we have. Jennifer, we want to thank you very, very much. And I'll, I'll just finally say I'm happy to provide any support that I can going forward. Thank you. Okay. The next on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting, the minutes of December 7th, 2021. Move to approve. Move to pro <laughs> second. So we have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, Laura. I'm Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, next on the agenda. We have invited um, the community development planner slash ADA coordinator, Keith Boyd, Benoit. And it's an honor to have you here, Keith. As you know, that there is some questions, not just the ADA activities, including the 95,710 grant for assisted living system, which you're gonna be talking about um, shortly. I think other counselors might have other questions that they might present to you. So welcome Keith and um, we'd like to hear what you have to say to us. Sure. Uh, well, just thank you, Jennifer McKenna for your comments. Um, uh, I did not know the difference between cochlear implant users and deaf people and how their needs are different. So thank you, that's an educational. Um, but, um, so I'll just give a kind of a brief overview of what I've done since I came on and then I'll go into the grant. Um, so one of the first things I did as the ADA coordinator is um, do the final edits on the transition plan. And that's like the, the city's um, analysis of ADA accessibility, the physical environment being the city hall, Memorial Hall, things like that. And then the website, website is, um, you know, it's how people communicate and get information, whether they're blind or deaf or um, they have their full sight. Um, and then, you know, some of the recommendations in there, um, you know, such as assisted listening devices in um, in the in the hearing room, uh, city council chambers, and then senior center. Um, and I did go through um, before I came there. I just kind of went through their top ten recommendations, and a lot of them were with the disability commission. We're kind of working on, and some of them just kind of happened um, by me taking the job. You know, so one is consolidating all the. Um, ADA and uh, Section 504 responsibilities into one position um, so that whether it's a service or actual physical built environment type of um, impediment to someone, uh, there's a grievance or something, that it's all in house with one person, maybe it's just kind of disconnected. Um, and some of the things that we've been working on the Disability Commission is looking on snow removal. How is uh, that something, uh, it's, it's an issue, uh, people not getting snow. Um, so we're still working on that. We don't have a, we don't have a solution just yet. Um, but I think for me, the bigger thing is um, that takes a little more time 
um, is really defining procedures and standards. Um, so for me, a lot of that was education, educational for me coming on board, reading transition plan, understanding the language. Um, so what the what we have to have, and we, we already had the um, a grievance procedure, uh, things like that. But overall, that plan kind of laid out this maybe lack of knowledge within the city. And so that is because the pieces of the of the job were disconnected. Uh, but also in my, I found it wasn't a centralized location of information. So what I did on, on the planning side is I created a website, ADA and accessibility website that's separate from disability commission. It's connected, so it's a link, they're linked. Uh, but it has kind of a lot of the information that someone might find um, and it's helpful to as things develop, we'll be a big grant. I put that information up there. But if someone has, if they land on that page, it shows them, you know, where they can um, make a complaint if the sidewalk's not shoveled. It uh, has a link to the uh, Massachusetts Office of Disability, which has training for civil, uh, citizens who are not like city employees. They can go to these free trainings that the state offers. Um, and someone at commission, I believe, um, has a certification to them. Uh, but it's very educational. And, you know, I think we would all agree that we value, you know, citizen comments and that type of participation. Um, but I really want that to be kind of like a living document um, and kind of like a shared memory um, where we're, people are finding that information and, you know, uh, like, like Jennifer coming here and telling us what we need to hear, you know, and I think she made some comments that, you know, I'm gonna have to integrate into um, or bring up with the Disability Commission about, um, you know, we need to, do we want to discuss uh, before we uh, sign a bid, you know, what are the, do you have any um, experience with these certain um, vendors, not vendors, but the, uh, the actual devices? Uh, some of the devices are very similar across the vendors. Um, so, well, I guess, yeah, I'll go into the, um, the accessibility grant now, unless someone has some questions. Um, so yeah, some of this was, um, you know, as we know, $95,000. Um, so the three rooms, city hall hearing room, which is right here in city hall, city council chambers, um, and then uh, the senior, senior great room. Um, so for the here, here in room, we're looking at something that uh, has like a wireless microphone so someone can move around if they're in the presentation. Um, and uh, like Jennifer said, uh, hearing loop. And that's where, you know, there's kind of microphones all throughout the, the room, but the people with the hearing aids can just tune in right to that machine, that device. And it gives them an amplified kind of sound, but it also removes some of those other sounds that uh, are not speech. So it's really, it's really good. It's not just amplification. Um, and then a feed that to Northampton Media. Um, something that will not probably happen with this grant is closed captioning. Right now we're on Zoom, um, and you know it's as you can see at the bottom of the screen. It's not 100% accurate, but it's getting there. Um, so, you know, the stuff we're looking at now is mostly hardware. And, you know, maybe when we get back, you know, back to in-person meeting, uh, we'll look at getting a software or seeing how we can integrate kind of closed captioning um, into the hearing room. Um, and council chambers, uh, very similar kind of uh, setup there. Um, but I guess one of the issues is the airlock on the side door uh, that's creating um, some interference uh, with, with hearing. Um, and I'll just note with city council chambers, um, and Jennifer mentioned this too, um, in the transition plan, uh, one of the recommendations was 
having uh, reserved seating at the front for people with um, uh, who are hard of hearing. So we, you know, prioritize two two seats, three seats at the front for people with um, hard of hearing, um, and we also might leave out uh, a space big enough for you know a, a wheelchair user at the front and the middle, and that actually increases the seating capacity, if you will, because we're there's not a lot of seats there, but if it was a full meeting, uh, we're create one space where one person put the wheelchair. Um, it also gives that visual line of sight to people who are talking in the front, to the people that are uh, need the need the visual. Um, and then the Cedar Center Great Room, uh, there's a lot of reverb there. Um, so I don't think the telecoils the, the would work um, in that room, um, but uh, the system otherwise is, is, is fairly similar. Um, and then as you see right now, Zoom has already integrated the live transcriptions. So I think after this grant, um, we, have, we have the three bids, um, $50,000 I think is, our, is the limit we told them we want them to be at. Um, so, you know, we're gonna want uh, the installation, the some most of the hardware, um, and then uh, we want some training uh, with the vendor to the city staff so that we can kind of uh, know what we're doing. And then we also a lot the other grant is fifteen thousand dollars to look at accessibility on the uh, Connecticut River Greenway, um, going down to the beach. Um, so that is, that's been awarded and uh, we're in the uh, kind of uh, discovery phase as we're with our, not our vendor, but our design team. So counselors, does anybody, any one of you counselors have questions to ask counselor um, Miore? Hey, thanks Keith. I'm, I'm very glad for the reorganization. I think it's, it, it makes so much sense to have a point person with the information and I'm glad for that. And I know you you just kind of started that journey. Uh, you know, a lot, my questions actually were from the, the notes of that meeting that seemed like a million years ago between Jennifer and Councillor Labarge and I and, and Wayne Biden. Um, so you've kind of addressed some of them. I guess I'm wondering when you make the decision about the vendors, going back to Jennifer's point, uh, who's going to be involved in that decision? Are you going to have um, folks who actually utilize these services and or uh, community members or or? Could you have that a, was yeah. that was not a discussion that me and Wayne had, uh, but I, I'm sure he's. Uh, I don't know what is uh, the time we decided, but I think that's uh, it's a great um, it's a great suggestion, and uh, you know, um, for me and and for Wayne as well, it's uh, these are all the all these systems are very new to us. So we're going off of what the vendor says, and um, I think it's a, you know I think it's a valid point to see if there's someone uh, in the community or at the disability commission to uh, you know at least to uh, to worry about. It. Excuse me. Um, okay, that um, yeah, I think that would be really helpful to have just an advisory um, committee to to help you with this this decision. And so it sounds like. The, when you say vendor, so it's just, you know, when we talk about multi, uh, multi-tiered multi approaches, you know, because of different um, various hearing issues, um, this won't do, this, this is one, this is like the induction ring, or, or are, you, are you saying the induction um, ring um, um, works, you know, is, uh, meets uh, the criteria for different kind of um, issues and, and um, disabilities folks have? 
that was very unclear. I guess I'm asking, what, so with the money you're you're looking at an induction ring, but that's not that's only going to hit one type of um, um, aid for us. Yes. So um, the closed cap currently the system is looking at be better for the hearing, uh, the T coil, uh, the cochlear implant. Um, systems. Um, right, okay. And later on, I think with the, the next iteration, we would look at closed captioning. But right now, um, if we wanted 100% accuracy, the, the best thing is still someone typing. Okay, so it, is it, is, are you going to use the grant money in a phase kind of way? You're going to do an initial kind of purchase of um, some equipment and then and you'll still have other uh, funds to build on that? I think that the, it not be phased out, but uh, 50,000 um, is, is, the, is the purchase in uh, installation from the vendors. Okay. Thank you. Keith, I have a question. Mm -hmm. On that 95,710, and you are saying that we only can use 50,000, correct? That's not that we, oh, I think part of it is, is um, the, the bidding process. It's easier to do a threshold um, and then we can use the money for something else. Uh, but that whole system is very new to me. So I haven't, I haven't uh, lived that yet, but I'm in the, in the learning process. And I, I have to agree with Jennifer. There's many, many people who have different types of hearing disabilities, and I'm one of them. And, you know, I sit where I am because of my doctors doing what they had to do for me to give me a good quality of life and to be able to hear during open public hearing and also counselors that are near me. If a voice is to the right, I have amplifiers, that little antennas that you cannot see that go over the top of my head and into my left ear. I lost all my hearing in my right ear seven years ago with 48% of a loss on the left ear due to a virus that was in Northampton. And I wasn't the only one. Um, we had several people in Northampton who had the virus. And my doctors at Bay State spent many, many months trying to save my hearing. So I understand where Jennifer is coming. I think it's very critical that an advisory committee be formed. And I think that members of the public actually should be involved in that who are hearing impaired. Because I think that's where the quality is and giving not just us our quality of life, but everybody else who's been affected with that disability. So I want to thank Rachel, thank Jennifer, because to me, this is a huge concern I've had even before I had a problem of helping out people with a hearing disability. Many, many years we've been working on this and we've come a long way but it shouldn't have taken us this long just to get what we're getting at at $50,000. To me, somebody's hearing is more valuable than $50,000. Whatever it's going to cost is what we should put there to make it happen. So that's my feelings. Yeah, I think uh, it's a valid point uh, to uh, make sure all the different needs are met, and um, you know how how long for the technology to come along where it's you can have these meetings and it's translated live. Um, so some people have waited a long time for this type of being able to fully integrate it into the meetings. You know. I also, too, I have noticed that a city councilor um, for, I don't know, three, four years, we've had young, young youths come into city council, young, who also are wearing hearing aids. So 
I think this is something that is extremely important for their quality of life to be able to come into any one of our meetings, no matter where it is in our city buildings, that they also are included to be able to hear what they should be hearing. So that's just my thoughts. Cost, um, Councillor Foster. Thanks. Thank you, Keith, for, for sharing about this. And I do, um, I want to echo what Councillors Mayori and Labarge said. I, th I think this is a big step. Um, you know, we've definitely have heard from many folks uh, with hearing impairments who aren't able to participate um, in meetings. Um, and that's, you know, that's a barrier that I'm really glad to see being addressed. And one thing I didn't quite catch, and it's because I'm not familiar with the technical aspects of this, but there's a demographic that I'm not sure is being talked about yet as well. And that's people who don't necessarily have a documented hearing impairment, you know, hearing aids that can tune into the system. But there are so many people who are particularly older who are beginning to lose hearing, but not to the point where they're wearing hearing aids or getting that diagnosed. And any meeting with background noise or that kind of large chamber, council chambers like room where sound absorbs, um, or if they're not looking directly at the speaker, that that sound gets lost and people aren't necessarily even aware of it. They just will sort of maybe stop going to restaurants or stop going to meetings because it's hard to participate, but they're not yet at a point where that where that's the known cause. And, it, and a fantastic for solution for that is um, the amplification that's around the room, um, you know, the senior center has it, it's outstanding where, um, you know, if, if a speaker wears a microphone, it's picked up and it's just very low level amplified behind as well. Um, and it can really help people who don't have a documented hearing impairment, but um, their hearing just isn't gonna catch some of the same things. So I just wanted to put that out there. And that's where, again, I guess I will third or fourth the recommendation or, or the importance of ensuring that a variety of people, particularly with hearing impairments are pulled into the process before a system is purchased and installed um, because that's the group that's gonna think of issues like that and, and have experience using systems in a variety of places. Thank you, Councillor. I believe the, um... The systems have um, a set of amplified hearing. Um, um, these things, the things in a word. Uh, but look, I'm, I'm checking each quote right now to double check that I, because all these are um, all very new to me myself. But let me just double right. check. Oh, if I may, uh, if I'm not too out of turn. I'm not thinking about the headset that you wear because so many of the people I'm talking about aren't yet aware that they have hearing loss or are not ready to wear a headset. I'm talking about something that's always on um, okay. that's that's actually accommodating um, people who aren't yet at that point of wearing a headset. Just wearing gotcha. a headset is a barrier. Gotcha. Councillor Quinlan. Well, I don't. I don't have an awful lot to add to what what my colleagues here have offered, uh, other than my gratitude, uh, and and that I agree wholeheartedly with with everything that's been said today about uh, community participation in this um, in this venture. I think uh, Councillor Barge mentioned an advisory board. You already have quotes in place. Uh, it may you know really be. Uh, I would just encourage you to act with urgency. Uh, and I know that Director Fiden would would probably support this. It just seems like this is the right way to go about this. Uh, so I just wanted to say that and thank you very much, Keith, for the presentation and, uh, uh, and your work. Thank you, Councilman. Jennifer, would you like to um, talk again? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, I'm not understanding whether, I just wanna make sure I understand correctly what's on the table. It sounds like 
putting a hearing loop in city council chamber is a plan, but that you said that the senior great room, senior center great room would, because of, because of reverb or interference would not support a hearing loop. Is that correct? That is my understanding of the technology and how it operates. Okay. Yes. So there would be a hearing loop in the great room, I mean, in the council chambers, and then, and would there also be um, a, a device with headphones? Would there be both? I'm checking the, the, that I sell file with the different members now. I mean, to, to um, Council Member Foster's point that there are a lot of people with a lot of people with hearing loss that who don't wear hearing aids, let alone have an implant, um, who are just yeah. struggling to catch um, all the time. And um, amplification alone may help some of them, but there are also issues with amplification that can just be distorting. Um, mm -hmm. So figuring out, you know, so anyway, and a lot of times there, I mean, I've been in a million places where there's and seen a million versions <laughs> and tried to use a million of those versions of different head things with headphones, devices attached to headphones. Um, there's, I thought, oh, that seems like it's in a whole world of options, some of which um, could, could be really useful um, and many of which would not be. So anyway, I just wondered, I wasn't understanding whether that's on the table as well as the induction loop. And if so, what you're looking at in terms of for what audience, for what demographic you're, you're looking at to build that, that also purchasing individual units. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just looking over these again. So there's three vendors, three rooms. So there's nine different possibilities. Um, and I, from, from what I'm seeing, it doesn't look like I think only one room has um, a speaker um, that they're um, proposing, and that was for the hearing room. So the, you know, the, how the different vendors looked at this, um, they took it, um, some of them took it in a different direction within the scope of work. Um, but I, I only, I'm only seeing a, so when we say proposal, like we haven't awarded anyone anything yet. So um, there's, you know, one of three possibilities for a room, I guess. So it, I would say it would be really helpful if, if there isn't, if we can put together an advisory group for, for that advisory group to be able to review the proposals for sure, because I'm, I have many questions that, um, you know, based on what you've been able to share um, that might be answered by the, by well, looking specifically at the, at the, at the specifics of a proposal. Um, I would also say, are there, are there municipalities that are ahead of us that would be models to look at? You know, do we know of other city councils that have, you know, equipped their hearing rooms um, what's worked, what hasn't worked so well, what, you know, that, and have maybe even assessed with the community, you know, what's working, what's not working and, and made improvements. Uh, we, we, this is a world of expertise. We shouldn't ha have to recreate the wheel. Um, so I don't know whether you, you've been able to connect with other folks who incomparable, you know, um, physical layouts and purposes that have already done this. I have not. Um, but I, I will add that uh, I think it, uh, in principle, totally 100% agree with public participation and looking at it. I don't know if that's looking at actual bids is, is actual proper or legal. Um, so I'd have to double check that that is okay. So I don't want to promise it'll happen because if it's if it's against the law, I'm not gonna no, do it. I totally understand that. But if it could be translated into a, a yeah. list of bullet points of, yeah, you know, sure. this is what's being proposed. Um, I, ju I just have to echo what everyone has said so far, which is that you, you know, um, unless you have people who use these devices and have been in situations where the devices are offered and they don't work, 
um, it, you're, you don't want to waste that money. And you will, make, you will make mistakes because you don't involve people who know who are the users. I wonder if the vendors that have submitted the bids would have a list of other clients that they've had that, have, you know, to Jennifer's point, uh, that have already put these things in place. Uh, might be an interesting uh, way to gather that information quickly, as they'll, they would love to write the contract, I'm sure. Yeah. Councillor Foster. Just a process note. I mean, there's so many ways it could happen with an advisory committee. Um, I also don't know what your timeline is um, and or, you know, kind of what's on the table, but um, seems like potentially opportunity for public hearing um, or if that landed in um, a community resources committee or something like that um, as an opportunity to, to put things out publicly and, and um, you know, that's just putting it out there as, as one idea or potential avenue for um, drawing in public participation. Yeah, I was I was thinking Disability Commission, but uh, also community issues. I'll just add one more thing, which is um, Mary Jo Stanley, who I believe is on the um, is listening in. Um, is on the, I, I believe has been and may still be on the Forbes Accessibility Committee, um, has so has also been involved in a whole process that went on at Forbes in terms of figuring out how to make the, um, make services available, um, including the meeting room, um, make services accessible, including the meeting room there. So um, I, would, I would also suggest checking in with the Forbes Committee if you haven't, they may have, um, intelligence and lessons learned that would be useful for the city council in general. Um, Keith, I, I want to echo what Councilor Foster had just brought up. I think, like you said, you were going to bring it up at the Disability Commission. I think, why don't we look at having a joint meeting with the Disability Commission and Community Resource. Do you think that's a possibility? Keith? Yeah. If that's if they have joint meetings in the city, then yeah, let's do it. So we could bring that up at our um, for the agenda for this month coming up and question about having that joint meeting, um, the Disability Commission and the Community Resource Committee. And possibly Councilor Foster could bring that issue up on that committee also. Thank you. Yeah, um, I if it's possible to have an um, uh, abnormal meeting, like an extra meeting or something, I, I think um, we'd want it to move sooner rather than later. So I don't know what the timing is, um, but if it's something that we could do, you know, in three weeks' time from now, uh, that would that would kind of help the process instead of waiting an extra month. Uh -huh. before we get the uh, feedback that we can go to the vendors or, or do that. I'll leave that up to you, Keith, and the Commission on Disabilities, and um, Councillor Foster will handle her side of it to see when we could set up something like this. But I think it's very valuable because you've got two committees working together and I think we're going to get more participation by doing that. Councilor Mignor. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I, and um, I think kind of great. And I, I still think it would be um, very valuable for um, 
folks with hearing impairments to look at the very specific vendor offers because I think it, you probably get into the weeds there um, in the way that maybe it doesn't always happen in council meetings. But I think I think it'd be really valuable to have the joint meeting as well. And I was just going to say, let's remind each other when we get back in person in um, in our council chambers to to really explore the idea of of changing the layout there. I know we're really impeded by you know some legal issues about um, exits and such, but um, uh, we, others have talked about it for other reasons too. So it'd be interesting to kind of um, to take a, a real good look around and think, see what we can do to make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Keith. What about at JFK when they have their school committee meetings there? Is this system going to be placed also at that school? Uh, I mean, for the grant, that's not what we said we're going to use the money for. So um, we can't use that money. Um, I, don't, I don't personally know what the process of capital improvements in the school are um, and what we're doing. Um, I do know for uh, ADA, uh, they have their own ADA coordinator. So although something there in the city happens that is an ADA issue, uh, they have their own person. Um, who, who is their ADA coordinator? Because I had once asked the superintendent and he didn't know. And I'd like to know who is the ADA coordinator with the schools? Do you know who it is, Keith? I, I do not, but I'm, I'm looking. Councillor Miori. Just a quick question. So that, so I, I am assuming the induct, the uh, induction loops are not portable because that would be a great technology. <laughs> That's too bad. I'm dreaming too big over here. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? Um, on that point, uh, Rachel, the, um, there are personal induction loops, which is again, it's like a, an individual device that will, it's supposed to function the same way. And my experience with them is that they're, they usually don't work very well. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Councillor Foster. Thanks, Councillor Labarge. Um, Keith, I had one more question for you as well. And I um, am glad to see the steps the city is taking and that you're taking on the ADA transition plan. It's really, um, I could wax poetic about, sometimes there's this disbelief that there a plan exists on paper and then it actually is a document that starts to guide steps forward. And I have seen that in a variety of different ways um, over the years. And so I'm just really glad to see these steps taken. And I know one of the, the big issues um, was the lack of accessible restrooms in city council chambers. And I was curious, just sort of as you look at the plan as a whole, I mean, that's just one detail of it, um, but what are the next What's the, going to be the sort of next big push or, or uh, seeking funding for grant, grant funding? What, what's the next point that you're hoping to address with it? Um, good question. I mean, I know that's a big one, uh, you know, and it, looking at the space is very tight. So without, you know, just as a practical standpoint, without increasing the footprint or blowing out walls or changing the hallway, you know, you'd either, you'd have to lose, uh, I mean, the, a stall. So it might be just become a one person, uh, you know, room as it were. Uh, but for grant that's available, I know CDBG is 
um, if it we I think we can do it, but it's because it's primarily a general government. Most of it is um, general government, so it there might be some sort of way you can. If it's open to the, the public all the time, then it's uh, eligible for CWG. Uh, but grant-wise for other things, um, there's, all, there's always the next grant. But I think for this one, it's every other year. Um, uh, but I don't know what other grants are out there um, myself uh, on, a, on a kind of rolling basis. I do know, Keith, um, at Ryan Road School, um, a couple of teachers had brought me into the bathrooms in there. And the bathroom, like what Counselor Foster's talking about, was inadequate. And I even talked with a superintendent at the school that day. When you have young elementary students that are in wheelchairs, it becomes very, very difficult when you have two staff attempting to go into a bathroom. And sometimes they have to use a Hoyer lift. The Hoyer lift is placed in another room, a larger room, okay, where the nurse has her desk in that room. So they take the Hoyer lift, bring it, put the child in the Hoyer lift to get him into the bathroom and lay him, I mean, sit him down on the toilet. So anyways, the money was put in for the capital improvements at Ryan Road because of your AD laws. I mean, you were looking at children being put into a predicament of a safety issue and also staff. So I'm glad that I my book was delivered to me today on the capital improvements and I'm waiting to see of what is being done with the bathrooms for the schools because at that point nobody knew even a school committee member I went to didn't know who the coordinator was and at that time the superintendent so bathrooms seriously need to be looked at at our schools and accommodate people okay with disabilities and wheelchairs right down the line so when I hear, well, we might have to wait a year, well, they've been waiting quite a bit. And it's like, where's the fine line that we make a choice here in the city? Do we accommodate the people who live here, the children who live here, versus spending for consultants for, and I don't have a problem about the looks of Main Street and that, but to me, I feel my money, my taxpayers' money, should go to the people living in this city who we need to go ahead and make people have a good quality life and our children with certain types of disabilities. So when I'm hearing today from you, probably in a year, why a year? Is it because we're using this grant right now for, for the equipment we need for the hearing? There's no other grants out there that we could look at. Oh, when you're awarded a grant, you know, you apply and you tell them exactly what you're going to do, and you get the grant and you do exactly what you said you're going to do with that money. Um, and there's, you know, there's only a certain amount of grants every year, and uh, some of them are, you know, either they're met every year or they are. Um, if you're awarded one year, you can't get it this next year, or you can apply and you know they uh, you can apply every year, and whether or not you get it, you know it doesn't matter. Um, so each grant is very different. Um, some of them are planning, you know, related. So the transition plan, I believe, that was funded by a grant, and it was a planning grant. So it was a way to study, do an analysis of the city. And, you know, barriers, physical and structural, whether they're, um, you know, the systems in place and the grievance procedures and things like that, policies. 
Um, so that became our transition plan, which is now guiding the work that we need to do to look for grants to do the physical and then, you know, what we need to do to fix ourselves so that we're not just saying we are, um, you know, an ADA friendly city, but we're actually doing things that make sense to follow that plan. So there's, there's only a certain amount of grants uh, and, you know, um, that's, yeah. But the whole capital, like budgeting thing, that's, that's not my, not my uh, expertise. Does um, any counselors have any other questions? Just to thank Keith once more for coming in. This is incredibly uh, helpful and I'm, I'm excited that we're moving forward on this and I'm, I'm excited that you're in this role. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for being here and we appreciate the updates that you have given us. And for any reason, if you do find out that there's a grant out there somewhere, I have to agree with Councillor Oster about the bathroom at our council chambers. It's just not adequate enough. It's not big enough. So hopefully, I mean, we've done it with grants for the sidewalks, the curb cuts, and back to City Hall, the Commission on Disability. I spent a lot of time with the ADA coordinators to make that happen. So maybe there is a wish list there that we could look at that bathroom also. Thank you. Will do. Uh, and I love spending other people's money. So it's, you know, we get a grant. We're gonna we're gonna use it. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Well, the next item on the agenda is items referred to committee, which we don't have. And for new business, um, first on new business is our mayor, David Narkowitz, has accepted our invitation to attend our meeting on April 5th, 2021. I also know, I think Karen Foster had already had her concerns and sent her questions in. If for any reasons you counselors want to ask the mayor questions, please send them to counselor, I mean to our city clerk, Laura Fletzer. And I would appreciate that because I have some questions to ask the mayor also. Counselor Quinlan. These are questions around the topic of, of appointments. No. Well, yes, about appointments and Karen, you can talk about she has great concerns and I'm glad we're having this meeting on it. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I didn't send a question that was uh, would be out in left field. <laughs> well, I think you could ask. You could ask something. <laughs> That's what he's there for. But we'll do Karen's question first because that is a big one. Karen, maybe you can explain a little bit. Sure, Councilor Labarge. Um, and I... I I actually think that as the applications we've seen coming through the past many months, we've seen a really diverse group of people of ages and um, gender identity and, um, you know, renters, um, you know, people of color. So we've actually seen a relatively diverse group of people applying for appointments to city boards and commissions. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm really excited about it. Um, and so I, I'm mostly interested in opening up kind of a, a conversation with the mayor about how is outreach being conducted? What is the actual process for appointees and how can we support that work? Just knowing that it's it's our role to approve the appointees, but I, I would love to know what the other hand of, you know, uh, outreaching and vetting and sending the appointees. I, I just wanna make sure the hands know what each other are doing. And um, so I'm very interested in learning more about the mayor's process there. I, I, I think it's a great subject. I think Councilor Quinlan, wasn't there a problem? We had five women of color who had to drop off the commission. Uh, th yeah, three on the Northampton Police and Review Commission, yeah. Right, exactly, and it had to do, wasn't it the time involved in it? Yeah. 
yeah, it was quite a quite a commitment. Okay. So um, that takes care of number seven for new business and eight. Do I hear? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call, Laura. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes.